This is the Mississippi. It's North America's second largest river and the third largest river basin in the world, stretching 2,340 miles from here at Lake Itasca to here, the Gulf of Mexico. And these, these are its tributaries. Over 30 connected rivers, lakes, and canals, including the largest river in America, the Missouri, make up the Mississippi River system. This seemingly uninteresting piece of geography is the most important water body in the United States. With an average surface speed of 1.2 miles per hour, the Mississippi flows at a walking pace, which doesn't sound exciting, but that's part of what makes it so great. In fact, this water system that you're looking at is the key to America's dominant economic and geopolitical position, and the foundation for the greatest superpower the world has ever seen. This isn't because it's a huge hydroelectric power or drinking water source, or because it's home to many ecologically relevant fish species. Those things are great, but the power of America's grand waterways lies in the unrivaled money it makes from trade, transport, and export. There's simply no global competition when it comes to the financial numbers these inland waterways bring in. Let me explain. The Mississippi is massive. It drains water from 31 states and two Canadian provinces. When you add the Great Lakes here, and these two intercoastal waterways known as the Gulf and the Atlantic, you've got a system of around 28,000 miles of navigable waters, making the Mississippi Basin the largest navigable waterway in the world. This means that the US's combined navigable waterways are larger than that of the world's combined navigable waterways. If that's an advantage, this next fact is simply unfair. This water system sits across the single largest chunk of arable farmland in the entire world, beating out India and Brazil. This is huge because it means goods from the US interior, such as corn, grains, coal, petroleum, and steel, move within and outside of the country on a mode of transport that came freely built into the land. The Mississippi connects all of the goods manufactured along it to the Gulf, the Atlantic, and major cities like Chicago, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Houston, and New Orleans, moving over 630 million tons of freight every year. And that's big money. Just this upper Mississippi basin area, which includes Illinois, Missouri, and Minnesota, generates around $345 billion from commerce every year. Now compare that to the Hidrovia Paraguay Paraná waterway. This system runs through Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Bolivia, bordering the countries as well. Yet despite this, it currently handles only 20 million tons of freight, and it has several unnavigable sections, such as the Itaipu Dam. The Itaipu is the second biggest hydroelectric dam in the world, yet it's unnavigable, and efforts to upgrade it have been stalled as the connected countries often disagree on how to move forward. With the US, collaboration to raise funds and secure construction isn't as complicated. The US Army Corps of Engineers, along with Congress, simply manage the US waterways. Even when you compare the Mississippi to a navigable system like the Amazon River, the numbers don't measure up. The Amazon is naturally deep, so it can take on larger vessels. Yet still, it only carries around 25 million tons of freight every year, thanks to the environmental damage that comes from building locks and dam systems along such a richly forested area. In the end, the US simply dominates. And all of this economic activity explains why every major city with a population of over 300,000, except Atlanta and Denver, is on a waterway. But building empires along rivers is not unique. Early civilizations built settlements that became major cities and economic hubs along the Nile and Tigris rivers. So what makes America's case so extraordinary? Is it sheer luck and a matter of first come first serve? Or a calculated construction of the waterways we see today? Well, it's a bit of both. To truly understand how the United States secured such a rich economic resource, let's jump back to America's early days as an independent nation. They already had a head start with the Mississippi that could take a cheap vessel from one end of the country to the other without many obstacles. But transporting those goods didn't come easy. The founding fathers realized how fortunate they were to be in a country with such interconnected waters. But there were no locks, dams, or canals to make them more navigable and profitable. To do that, they needed to, according to the constitution, investigate, develop, and maintain necessary navigable channels. So before the first formal engineering school was made, volunteers from across the country put their heads together and made the South Hadley Canal in 1792. By the time the Erie Canal was completed in 1825, the Great Lakes were instantly connected to the Atlantic, moving goods from the inland to the east coast. Despite some trial and error, this momentum picked up kicking off an industrial age powered by inland waterways as people settled near these canals for the next 200 plus years. Today, that foresight and early planning have transformed into over 12,000 miles of commercial inland shipping routes. That's more than South America's, Europe's, and Asia's combined. 
That means that the greatest advantage the US has when it comes to maritime and trading capabilities is the sheer size and ease that comes with its waterways. The Mississippi and most of its tributaries are at low elevations, which creates calmer waters and minimal interruptions from steep waterfalls and raging stone-filled rapids. The cargo ships, much like this one, that float along these waterways, are simple with minimal operational requirements due to the lack of potential damage caused by rough waters. It also means that these waterways don't need a lot of maintenance to keep them running, as locks, dams and canals face little overall erosion, wear and tear. These large, affordable, low-maintenance waterways allow for huge amounts of cargo to be transported from one point to another at a rapid pace. Take for instance the use of barges. A typical barge like this can transport about 1,750 tons of goods, and they're usually clustered into groups of 10 to 15 on a tow. So at capacity, that's 26,250 tons of goods per tow. Now compare that to a 108-car unit train. One jumbo car can carry around 110 tons. So a 108-car train would carry only 11,880 tons. Trucks are even worse. I mean, a large semi-truck can only carry 40 tons at the absolute maximum. So just one barge can deliver the equivalent of 38 trucks. To move the same amount of cargo as a 15-barge tow, it would take 1,050 large semi-trucks, or six locomotives, and a ridiculous 216 rail cars. Then there's the speed. One of these vessels can be loaded with 10,000 tons of cargo in under 4 hours and unloaded after travel within 8 hours. This makes the barge system way more economical and environmentally conscious than road or rail. This efficiency is why the commercial water system collectively makes over $1 billion per day and over $405 billion yearly. That kind of money can only mean tremendous job creation along the banks of these inland waterways. And it's true, both the upper and lower Mississippi River areas combined support over 1.2 million jobs from the farmers to the loaders and tow drivers. This system of employment enriches the Midwest population, raising the overall GDP of a nation that already controls 30% of the world's wealth. But, and I hate to be that guy, it's not all smooth sailing. If it wasn't for this wise but expensive move, the billion dollar waterway wouldn't even exist anymore. You see, the United States has been spending a whole lot of money to keep the Mississippi on the same course that started this waterway dominance hundreds of years ago. Over time, rivers change their course naturally as the earth moves, contracts and stretches. Though it's natural, it doesn't work for America's economic plans. If the lower Mississippi were to assume the course it was meant to take in the 1970s, its true delta would no longer be in New Orleans, where centuries of infrastructure have enabled smooth entry into the Gulf of Mexico. It would flow into the Atchafalaya River and into an undeveloped patch of land 75 miles from New Orleans. To move all of the development established in New Orleans and Baton Rouge to a random patch of land would cost billions. Luckily, the Army Corps of Engineers, which has been in charge of this vast waterway for over 150 years, thought ahead. They built a $2 billion river control scheme that would force the Mississippi to flow toward Baton Rouge and New Orleans. It's a delicate balance that proves this waterway and the economic power it brings isn't guaranteed, and if it was to ever destabilize for any reason, the results would be catastrophic. Now, when it comes to outside threats, they aren't as big as you think. I mean, you don't need me to tell you that it's impossible to invade America. So, to be honest, the only country that can truly threaten the success of America's waterways is America itself, and it all starts with the struggle to maintain what they already have. A 2017 infrastructure report from the American Society of Civil Engineers concluded that a large number of the 300 commercial ports, 240 lock chambers that receive large tows of cargo, and several dams and canals had grades of C or D and needed major upgrades. And yes, I know I said these things face little overall wear and tear, but for example, over 80% of America's locks are over 50 years old and have exceeded their engineered design life. So to secure these upgrades, the waterways need heavy investments. And this is where foreign competition comes in. Waterways from countries like Brazil, China, and Europe have the potential to outinvest the US's current structures. Just look at China's Yangtze River, the world's busiest inland freight river. The numbers are staggering. The Yangtze moves around 2.6 billion tons of freight yearly. The river touches China's major metropolitan areas, its farming core, and major industrial hubs. So most of the cargo shipping is domestic, but the Chinese Ministry of Transport is working hard to transform their 10% of international shipping of inland cargo to a much higher number. And they've got the coastal ports to do so. In fact, local governments have overdeveloped their riverbanks, and the main Yangtze waterway already has over 3,900 cargo berths ready to process load and discharge goods. China hasn't stopped there though. They're investing in rivers in Southeast Asia and South America, like here on the Mekong River. Starting in China and traveling through Southeast Asian countries like Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand, the waterway ferries 128 million tons of freight each year, with most of the investment towards harvesting the river's potential coming from China. Meanwhile, in the US, 
Stalled annual spending towards waterway modernization has already lost the country billions of dollars of economic value. And while that doesn't sound like much, backlog projects could quickly escalate that number. A 2007 plan to renovate the Upper Mississippi Dam and Lock System failed due to a lack of funding, proving how hard it can be to raise the capital needed for these systems. Beyond tricky investments, the Mississippi Waterway has another threat that affects every river in most parts of the world, drought. In October 2022, a drought affecting the central US led to water levels so low that vessels were stuck in some areas, causing a backup of 2,048 barges and 117 vessels as rivers temporarily closed. This river basin produces 92% of America's agricultural exports, so one drought could ruin countless jobs and result in billions lost. That's what happened in 2012, when the Great Plains drought led to the river closing three times and the loss of $35 billion. The drought has gotten so bad in America's southwest that there's a plan to divert some of the Mississippi's water to be pumped into the region. While possible, it would cost billions and take years to fully develop such a system. This isn't an issue that only affects the US, as the Rhine River in Europe is also facing a drought made more extreme by climate change, which is why the US is looking to kill two birds with one stone. Decrease road and rail freight, which will decrease carbon emissions, and keep their advantage by investing $2.2 billion to upgrade the waterway infrastructure, thanks to an infrastructure bill passed by Congress in late 2021. Nearly $829 million will go towards improving the Upper Mississippi, increasing the lock chamber's capacities, and repairing dams. Beyond the repairs, the investment will generate over $72 billion for the nation's GDP. And this is just one part of the nation's larger plans to focus on maximizing Mississippi's potential. So even with the threat of foreign investments, deeper waterways along the Amazon, and more coordination in the Yangtze, America only needs to make the right investments to stay ahead of everybody. Call it luck, call it strategy and decades of planning, call it both. Either way, the Mississippi River means the United States is not going to lose its economic dominance anytime soon. If the country plays its cards right, investing in advanced technology for its locks and dams, and securing a steady flow path that stays on course, it will continue to reap the benefits of near-perfect geography and terrific foresight. Basically, it's their game to win or lose.